Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. The nursery has tons of great looking plants. We'll show you how to pick the best ones for your home. Also, community gardens are sprouting all over. We'll tell you what you need to know to start and run one. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Walter Battle. Walter is a UT Extension County Director in Haywood County, and Joanne Waterman is here with us. Joanne is a TSU Extension Agent right here in Shelby County. All right, Walt, see all of these lovely plants we have on the table here. Yes. So how do we go about picking a good plant? Well, um, cause you know, folks are anxious to get out there and start picking these plants so they can get them in their garden. So let's help them out. Okay. Well, let's think of it in terms of, uh, the Clint Eastwood movie, the good, the bad, and <laughs> okay. the ugly. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, you know, you, you want to go to, um, I guess a nursery or whatever, uh, whether it be a store or whatever. And what you want to do is just kind of just slightly pull up. <laughs> now, and, and what you want to see is basically these white, these white roots here. That's what you want to see. Uh, that means these, this plant is healthy. It's, uh, you know, they're ready to go. You can go set them out. Uh, and I mean, that's just a pretty good looking set of mm -hmm. tomato plants there. Yeah, that I good. mean, I would be happy to put that in my garden. <laughs> um, and I mean, now, you know, be careful. Don't just go all over the place doing it because I'm sure the owner of the nursery <laughs> would be like, hey, at some point, you know, he's going to want you to, you know, not do that. Oh, we could just tell him Walt said you could do that. It'd be all right. <laughs> hey, don't put it on me. <laughs> uh, but also, as, as you can also see, as in the case here with um, uh, this Vinca, you know, here's a real nice. pretty set. But then, whoa, look at there. Uh, we have this uh, Anthracnose is just eating this up. I would uh, probably got some type of um, uh, disease, uh, obviously, uh, sitting here. Uh, Rhizoctonia, something like that. Charcoal rot is probably in there. And, you know, this obviously just, you just wouldn't want that. That's just where it's been over there in the nursery, just probably getting too much water. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't want to talk about anybody's watering techniques, but uh, that could very well be a problem. Here's another one with this sedum. Yeah, it looks bad. Uh, here's the good. <laughs> here's the bad. Um, that might again, be ugly, Walt. That, that's pretty bad. Right <laughs> this there. is pretty bad, yeah. isn't it? Uh, and as you can see, look at the yeah. look at the brown roots. Uh, I mean, and this thing is just soaked. I mean. I don't want to mess up the table here, but you can squeeze water. Yeah. Look at that. I mean, look at that moisture. I mean, it's just overwatered and it's just set over there in the corner somewhere. So you just wouldn't want to buy that one. Um, now, let's also look at something else that you might see. Okay. Uh, you, you'll see just average <laughs> old, just, you know. Now, here's this rosemary here. It, it's nice, uh, but Smells I'm sure. Good. Yeah, I'm sure it's. Look at that. Yeah, look at that. Look, look at those roots. I mean, it's just. It's root just, bound. just, yeah, just root bound. I mean, just, just a horrible example of it. I mean, a great example of root bound, I should say. And what, before um, we go further, so yes. what, what, what does the homeowner need to do about that when it's root bound? Can they just cut it? Yes, away? yes. You would just get this and just, just pull it apart. Okay. Now, some people take a little knife mm -hmm. and score it, as they call, but uh, that's what you would do with that. Now, obviously, here's a pretty oh, rosemary, nice. and I'm just a rosemary freak to start with. <laughs> So I, I use it a lot. Right. Uh, so this is a, just a great plant. So this is what you would want to buy right. and spend your money on. Now, speaking of, uh, we was talking about the root bound. Look here at the bottom. Pick those plants up and make sure you, that you don't get a lot of them with the roots like that. You know, yeah, hanging out, out the bottom coming of out the of the pot. Now, obviously, we can just cut those off sure. and still plant. But if you can get something different, you would want to do sure. so, you know. Now, um, I also have an example here. Um, this one's probably lacked a lot of nitrogen and water. Uh, just feel that, Joanne, that's pretty light, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It hasn't Very been light. watered probably in days. Uh, so you wouldn't want that. And definitely when you're going to plant 
we're going to put some fertilizer with this anyway. Okay. Uh, another one here that I have tomato plant. Look at this purplish. Oh, wow. uh, look. Uh, probably uh, what phosphorus, phosphorus deficiency easily. So when you would plant this, definitely put some six twelve twelve something like that in the hole with this plant. That's a good. That's pretty distinct. Yeah, know, that's pretty distinct there. Of um, deficiency. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, and I, and I know Joanne wouldn't put that in her community garden. <laughs> I don't think at she would. all. <laughs> no, no way. Now, uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, there's there's plenty of examples of good and bad. Um, here we have some. Uh, what's that? Verbena. Verbena. Yeah. Uh, you know, and look, that's obviously you wouldn't want to to buy that one. Uh, but uh, hey, you wouldn't mind buying this one right here. You see, that's nice, healthy wow. plant. You know, you want to take that home and plant it and have the yard, you know, the best looking yard on the street. So that's a good one as well. I also have some pepper plants here, um, and they're pretty good. Uh, these were taken care of. Uh, look at that good, healthy plant. And uh, I just love planting in these pots here. Yeah. They're just, you know, they're just going to rot into the soil. A uh, good earth-friendly way to, uh, to, to plant. Um, so that's uh, got quite a bit covered okay. right there with those. Now let's quickly talk about our bargain rack. <laughs> what do you have here on the bargain rack? Oh, some strawberries. Oh, man. Now, uh, uh, again, is that pretty light, Joanne, right there? <laughs> yes. That's light. Hadn't been watered. This was on the bargain rack the other oh day. Oh, my goodness. And just look at that. It's just dry and crumbly. I mean, just all this old dead material. These were some strawberries. Uh, always remember, you get what you pay for. Yeah. Now, uh, there are those who are trained uh, that can take these kind of plants and bring them back to life again. Mm -hmm. We can be Dr. Frankenstein and bring it back to life again. <laughs> and those are what we call master gardeners. All right. We learn those skills. <laughs> and also the people who go... Uh, through Joanne's program okay. the community garden. So they learn all that. So they can get uh, that. Resuscitate oh, yes. it, huh? Oh, yes. But, but, but be, really, be careful of that bargain rack. Sure. Uh, and a lot of times, too, uh, let me get that back up here. Uh, it's a reason it's a bargain. The bloom period is past. It's past, it. right. Um, and like I said, they're just trying to just get it out of there. Right. Uh, is all they're basically trying to do. But, uh, but I'm going to plant these. I'm, I'm going okay. to have those. Yeah, you're going to have to let us know, too. It yes. works out for you. Yes, yes, definitely. Okay, now look, while we have a little time left, we definitely want to talk about watering. Okay, So let's yes. talk about watering regimes and whatever else yes. we need to cover. Anytime you, you, you plant, you always start out, obviously, I like to put fertilizer down with it, and then also you want to water. Okay. Now, here's the key. Uh, a lot of plants, they don't like wet feet. Mm -hmm. They like moist feet. Just kind of, you just want to keep the soil moist not just soaking wet. Mm -hmm. And once established uh, as well, you know, your vegetable crops, uh, they like to have about an inch to an inch and a half, two inches of rain, I mean, or water every week. So okay. that can, because think about a vegetable is like 70% water right. to start with. So, and that'll keep that plant growing, uh, putting on blooms, you know, getting your pollinators in there, taking care of business mm -hmm. and, and hey, next thing you know, it's tomato time. Time to get it. Let's get it on the hamburger. And I tell you what, uh, if you have your vegetables in container yes. uh, gardens or ornamental plants in container gardens, they're going to have to be watered maybe a couple of times during the summer. Oh, absolutely. It's it pretty hot here. Absolutely. <laughs> in the summertime. So you might need to water those, what you think, twice a day? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. But the main thing is we want to water in the morning. Okay. We do not want to water at night because okay. remember that disease triangle, uh, you have to have, what, a pathogen? You got to have the right environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you got to have, and then a susceptible host. Right. And so, look, most fungus diseases, they like it dark and moist and humid. So it's nothing you can do about that, but you can control that moisture. Okay. You know, it's going to get dark, you know, you're going to have that humidity, but at least you can keep that water from getting on it okay. until about 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. All right. Water. Doesn't want to keep the water off the foliage at night. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, we appreciate that information. Yes, sir. All right. Another common weed we have here in the Mid-South is uh, poana, or annual bluegrass. It's actually a problem in agricultural crops also in our area, but uh, uh, about the only thing that'll take it out is uh, glyphosate. Uh, if it's a problem in Bermuda grass lawns, uh, you need to definitely make sure you spray before the Bermuda grass breaks dormancy. 
Uh, if you do nothing, it, since it is a winter annual, it will dry, uh, die out uh, as, as summer approaches, so as, as all winter annuals do. But uh, it can be kind of hard to control. Joanne, now before we get started talking about community gardens, can you let people know what exactly you do for UTTSU Extension Service here in Shelby County? I am the Small Farms Urban Gardens agent, so I help people with their community garden, starting a community garden, vegetable production, all of that good stuff, selling their produce at farmers markets, things of that nature. Okay. Now, where are we today? We are in Orange Mound. Uh-huh. And Mr. Mike Menace and Ms. Karen Menace Community Garden, which is associated with land development training center. Okay. So what they do, they help transition some of the people in the community back to the workforce. Okay, and that's a good deal. I, I'm, I'm sure they appreciate that a whole lot. Uh, now, so let's talk about community gardens. I mean, why are community gardens so popular anyway? Well, I think the main reason why they're so popular because nowadays we have a lot of communities that's considered food deserts. Mm -hmm. And this is a way to bring fr fresh produce back to their communities. And it teach kids and some adults <laughs> proper eating, correct eating, healthy eating. Okay. And it gives a sense of ownership to their community. Okay. Now, if, if people wanted to find out more information about community gardens, you're the person they see, right? They can contact me <laughs> any day, Monday through Friday. Okay. <laughs> 8 to 430 at the Agri Center at uh, 77 Walnut Grove Road, R901-752-1207. Okay. And what are some of the things that you can do for them to help them out? Uh, right now, I have seeds I can help them out. I can provide educational programs. If need to, I can show them how to get started, how to plant, how to harvest, uh, show them how to check their soil, which okay. is the most important yes, thing is. they need to learn how to do or to do before they plant anything. So I can do things of that nature. Okay. So somebody's probably watching this and they're probably thinking, I want to start a community garden. So how do they go about doing that? First, they need to <laughs> find the area or the lot or land that they want to plant in, okay. plant on, and get permission. If it's not their land, make sure that they get permission. And if it's not their land, once they get permission from the owner, get the history of the land so you oh, can know what cute. was there first, yeah. so you can do the proper soil testing because not only are you looking for nutrition, you need to see what other, maybe if it's chemicals in their mm -hmm. ground because if you mm -hmm. grow in those chemicals, you eat it, you put it in your body, so right. you need to test your soil and see if it's okay. But make sure you get the history of the land first. Okay, yeah, that's most important because uh, a lot of the homes in some of your older neighborhoods, you know, lead-based paint. Right. Uh, so there may be some lead in that area, something like that. And our labs don't test for labs, so don't test for le uh, lead. So I think there's a lab here in town that you can actually do that that will test for lead, but that's really important. There's no doubt about that. Yes, and it is a lab here. It's called AL Lab. AL, that's what it is. <laughs> they would test for uh, chemicals in the soil, so okay. if you need them, contact them. But we also test, but not for chemicals. Right, right. We're testing for soil, soil. fertility, right. and, and that's the best thing. Okay, so once they've done the history, the back, uh, background check, then what's the next step? Actually, the next step is to get you a committee together. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. put out flyer sign in your neighborhood, your community centers, your church, or just have a neighborhood watch or neighborhood meeting in the front lawn. Let people know that what you're trying to do and get people to sign up. And of course, you may have this huge sign-in sheet <laughs> or volunteers, but once it get hot, you know, uh -huh, which it will. they may slide <laughs> off. So make sure it's small enough where you can take care of it by yourself. Okay. So you would recommend starting a community garden off on a smaller scale and then expand? Yes. Okay. And like I said, a reason for that because, you know, once it get hotter, you have to see to a garden every day. Every it's something day. to be done. And when it's, it's pretty hot in Memphis. Right. Yes, and people it is. may not feel like working out there in the heat. And it's all up to you because it's something that you started treated as if it's your baby because mm -hmm. it is your baby. Mm -hmm. Take care of it so next year the people with the community can see that you're committed to it. Sure. And they will come in next the next growing season to help you out. Yeah, because the community garden is all about the community, right? It's right. all in the name. It's all about the community. So if they stop volunteering, you keep going. Right. Somebody will catch on and okay. join you. Yeah, and you're right, there's going to be a lot to do. There's going to be weeding, there's going to be working the soil, there's going to be harvesting. We have yes. a long harvest season uh, here in Shelby County, so it's going to be a lot of work, and you need a dedicated volunteer base, that's for sure. Yes, dedication. So, mm -hmm. like I said, if they, 
And if they stop, you recruit some more. <laughs> Just keep recruiting. It's the community, it's the neighborhood. Bring those people in. Look, kids passing by, riding mm -hmm. their bikes. Bring them in, make them feel welcome. And of course, let their parents know that you're yes. working with them. Yes. And get permission from the parents. But let the community know, you, you know, this garden is here for the community, not just me. Okay. Now tell us, what are the benefits of having a community garden? Uh, the benefits are to teach kids how to eat healthy, well, mm -hmm. the neighborhood, the community, how to eat healthy. In some areas, it cut back on crime because they see, hey, this neighborhood is right. taking pride in their community. Right. They're not going to allow this here. Um, it teach, it's a variety of things. And one research showed that communities with community gardens, they have better eating diets. Right. That's good. So it's, it's a lot of health benefits. Um, teach people how to work and give you a mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. skill because the garden is working so they teach you how to work you have right. to get up every morning to work your garden so okay it's a lot and i do understand that we are in a few uh, food desert right so uh having a community garden here will definitely help the communities no doubt i mean you have fresh uh, produce that's being grown here uh it looks good too by the way he's done an excellent job yes. here uh so yeah having a community garden to me is just a win-win just for everybody mm-hmm yeah. And it is because it's not just for your community. Other people passing mm -hmm. by, that can give them the idea, hey, let me go back to my community and start a community garden. Because community gar gardens can be stored in any community if you wanted to. Okay. If, if it's allowed, especially if you have a neighborhood association. Right. You know, so if it's allowed, start one. Okay. And again, I think it's a you know, good way to get people out. Yes. To meet each other, to congregate, mm -hmm. maybe even uh, harvest some of the stuff in their community garden and cook it. You have a cookout in your community garden. I think those would be some good things to do. That would be a great thing because in a community, you have more than one culture. So different True. cultures, you grow what your culture is accustomed to and I mm -hmm. grow. And we just come together and have, like you say, a cookout. Yeah, a cookout. Teach us a new eating habits. You right. know, try something new. Right. So it's, they're good for the communities, for everyone, basically. So everybody serves the purpose in the community garden and it helps out all the citizens. Sure, sure. And I think this would be a wonderful place, again, you mentioned it earlier, to have kids come out and, and see what's going on, because most kids today don't even know where their food comes from. Right. So what a great educational tool for the kids to see what's being grown and say, hey, okay, you know that carrot you ate? It came out of the ground right here. Yes, and then you can pull the carrot out of the ground, wash it off, let them eat it fresh out of the ground. I think that would be good. And it tastes so much better. And they will start liking it. And start right. eating more fresh fruits and vegetables as they grow older. Right. And, and I think too we can get more kids interested in agriculture. Yes. Because one of these days, you know, we're not going to be working for extension forever, right? So <laughs> right. we need some folks to come up behind us that's, and uh, to educate the public about, you know, gardening. Yes. Sure. And that's all our children need a little exposure to agriculture. Yeah. It's not whole work. I mean, just to put them out there in the yard and say, hey, let's plant something. Even if you have to start your community garden in little pots, just mm, I didn't think about that. start in pots okay. and gr go and grow as you go. Okay. So, so you can uh, start a community garden for pots. How about that? If you have limited space, why not? Do it, do it. All right, thank you, Joanne, for the information. We definitely appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Chris. No problem. Okay, just like on door locks, the three bottles of bowls of porridge, the soil has got to be in the right condition, too. Example being this right here, this pile right here, will not form a ball, so it's kind of a little bit on the dry side. This one right here, this is way too wet. This is one you're going to let set for at least two or three days and test it to find out if it's tillable. You don't want to put a tiller in that. Okay, the spinner piece, however, if I, they form a ball and I throw it up in the air, whoops, and it breaks apart, then it's just right for tilling. All right, here's our Q&A session. Joanne, you jump in there with us, all right? Here's our first letter, okay? I like getting these letters. Yeah. Like that. Need that. Let's see what we have here. Well, family plot. I have a wild mulberry tree which makes fruit, but before it can ripen, it falls off the tree. What's the problem? And this is from Miss Jean in Brighton. So, what do we think that problem might be for a wild mulberry tree? The, the only thing I can kind of think of is sometimes when uh, I guess the, the, the uh, 
bloom does not get properly uh, pollinated, uh, the tree will throw those blooms off. Mm -hmm. And also, in excessive heat, uh, trees and plants will drop blooms and things like that because that's how they deal with, you know, high temperatures and heat. Mm -hmm. So that would be my guess if I just had to answer it just off the cuff like this. I can go with that. You know, I thought about pollinators. Um, mm -hmm. You know, of course, you know, I'm thinking about, too, it's nature's way of kind of pruning, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. the tree itself. Right. Um, and kind of thinning it out, you know, That's so right. to speak. Uh, so, yeah, I, I thought about those. Uh, think about anything there, Joanne, that comes to mind? No. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought about those. Yes. Um, I mean, that would kind of be the logical thing. Okay. Uh, and, and something else, too, I would like to mention, Miss Jean, it'll be real good if we could see that tree. Right. Because uh, there may be some type of a disease going on. Right. You know, down at the bottom of it, maybe some borers or something mm -hmm. like that, which is causing them to throw off uh, those fruits, you know, early. Yes. So it could be something going on down in the soil itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be real good if we could see uh, the picture of that mulberry tree. But I hope that helps you out, and thank you for your question. All right, here's the next question. What are those large flying things that look like mosquitoes? <laughs> Jojo, you laughing? <laughs> no, they're large. They look like mosquitoes. They sure they're not mosquitoes? Because I've seen some <laughs> large ones around these parts. Yes. Uh, so what do we think that is, Walt? Uh, my best shot is a crane fly. I think it's a crane fly. Uh, we used to call them daddy long legs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they had the, the long, thin uh, mm -hmm. legs. It just kind of bounce around the place, you know? That's right. Yeah. Is there anything else you know about them? No, uh, I just know the further south you go sometimes, it may actually be a big mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> it may be. Yeah, it, may, it may be. But, yeah, th those are your, your crane flies. Uh, you know, I, I see them out in the yard. Mm -hmm. uh, look, they're not harmful. They don't bite. Yes. Okay. And here's a myth, okay. They don't eat mosquitoes, okay. They actually, you know, feed on, like, decaying leaves. Yeah. You know, organic matter, that type of stuff. And you see them near uh, bodies of water. Yes, so yes, I've noticed like, Yeah, because, yes. I mean, you see them around there pretty often. Uh, but, again, they're not going to do any harm, so I wouldn't worry about spraying or anything like that. And every once in a while, you may see one without legs because the birds get out them pretty good. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and take the legs from them. But, yeah, we call those daddy long legs back in the day. All right, so here's our next question, and this is a good one. How often do I need to fertilize my vegetables. Walt, and we're going to let JoJo add on to that too. Okay, well, I will say at a minimum uh, twice. Okay. Uh, I do like to fertilize that planting. Uh, I, I like to put down 6 12 12. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that just kind of gets things kicked off pretty good. And then at some point in the growing season, you have to come back and side dress. Uh, and that's when you just, you know, side dress your sweet corn, your tomatoes, or whatever. Uh, to, you know, to keep the yields up. Now, one thing I, I do want to warn on, okay, though, uh, when you side dress, it's usually with nitrogen. Do not get it on the leaves mm. because it will burn those plants. But uh, at a minimum twice, uh, you should fertilize. Okay, Joanne? Well, I agree with Walt, but I like to side dress my plants or vegetables after I get my first crop off for that season. Mm -hmm. So after I get my first crop, that's when I side dress. Okay, so, and you use nitrogen? As yeah, well lower nitrogen. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, okay, here's the next question. I have brown black tips on my pear tree. Yes. What do I need to do now? And, well, I, and let's tell them what those uh, brown tips are. I think we have some examples. Yes, uh, even though the, the, um, the caller has said pear tree, but just yesterday <laughs> I went out and was scouting an apple tree, same disease. Mm -hmm. What you have there is fire blight. And this is your uh, 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 brown tips that you're getting. You're going to get what we call the shepherd's crook yeah. that's going to um, develop there. Now, um, I do know from a commercial standpoint, uh, they will be using something like uh, agricultural streptomycin is what they're going to spray that tree with. And usually they're going to do it uh, about this time of year, maybe have already done it in April. So okay. just kind of depends. But for the homeowner, you can also uh, get your copper sulfate mm -hmm. and a Bordeaux mixture. And there's all types of formulas out there 
on the um, web page. Make sure you get one from a, an extension service, though. Okay. Uh, uh, I just don't have one in, in, in my head here. But they can mix that and spray the tree, and that will take care of it okay. as well. Mm -hmm. that, this is powder? Yes, this is okay. powder, and it just mixes in with, um, you know, just mix it up and spray it on. Uh, quickly, can't you prune that out? Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. you definitely want to prune this out. Okay, and make mm -hmm. sure you want to dip those pruners yes. in the right solution. That's right. You don't want to spread that disease. Okay. And, and then next year, now you're going to do it every year from here on out. Wow. Once you get like this, you're pretty much stuck with it every wow. year. So usually around April, May is when you're going to spray that. Uh, put that mixture out there and spray it about mm, every three to five days. Okay, wow. Uh, for about maybe two or three weeks. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if it rains, you have to spray again. You have to spray it again. Wow. All right. Thank you, Walt. Joanne, we're out of time. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016 or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.